911, what's the address of your emergency? I don't know, I'm on Avoca Street, I need someone right now. Okay, what's going on? I was supposed to meet my best friend, oh my god, you she's dead. I, you think your best friend is dead? Hello? 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 On the 18th of January, 2024, a 911 dispatcher responded to a tragedy. The operator tried to calm down the woman, trying to understand the situation. The responding officers were greeted by a shocking scene. So I gently knocked on it, opened the door, said, Jenny, come on, you never sleep in like this. Let's go. I'm here. Let's start our day. The officer discovered a finger on the nightstand, and then, in the dark room, found a body. They encountered another person asleep. Um, I then asked him I was going to need a little better understanding of how witchcraft could cause such injuries. At that time, Mr. Daisy ended the interview. The young man would turn out to be the son of the victim, accusing her of witchcraft and claiming he had rid the world of evil. Was it truly a witch hunt? I hope you enjoy life in prison. I can live forever. I have God. Welcome to our channel, where we unmask the horrors of real-life new cases and never-before-seen footage. This is the story of Jennifer Daisy and the tragedy that ensued. But first, a bit about the victim. I'm sorry that you're that far gone. Seriously. How does it feel to lose your whole family due to one thing that you did? Jennifer Jenny Daisy was born on August 24, 1977, and spent her life in Dubuque, Iowa. Jennifer attended Central Alternative High School, a foundation that shaped her carefree and unique approach to life. She was a loving soul who didn't let societal expectations dictate her path. Of all her roles, Jennifer considered motherhood her greatest accomplishment. She adored her three children. The eldest was Nick Fry, followed by Tyler in 1995 and Kylie Fry in March of 2005. Deeply religious, Jennifer also made lasting connections outside of the family. Her adventurous spirit took her far and wide. She lived life to the fullest and aimed to visit all 50 states, coming close before her journey ended. Jennifer Daisy's diagnosis of brain tumors came as a shocking and emotional blow to her loved ones. She underwent multiple treatments, including two brain surgeries, one in Iowa City and another just four months before her passing. She also received radiation therapy in an effort to manage the tumors. Despite the surgeries and treatments, Jennifer's condition remained challenging. Though she retained her mental competence, physical tasks became more difficult during her recovery, particularly tasks requiring strength, such as lifting items or carrying groceries. Her son Tyler moved back home to assist her with these day-to-day -day activities, including chores like cutting grass and heavy lifting, to ease her burden. She got a miniature labradoodle to help her go through the difficult time. His name was Echo. Though her condition was not immediately life-threatening, the tumors were inoperable, meaning they couldn't be fully removed. Over time, her quality of life was expected to deteriorate. Jennifer was dedicated to self-healing and had recently discovered a passion for gardening, another reflection of her nurturing nature. Revealed later by her daughter Kylie, Tyler had his own demons that he was battling. The 28-year-old struggled with schizophrenia. In December 2023, Jennifer had taken a vacation to Florida as part of her goal to visit all 50 states. Despite health struggles, having recently undergone brain surgery for tumors, she continued to stay active. Christy, a close friend, had been assisting Jennifer with her medical appointments and care both before and after the surgery. There was one problem. Tyler was abusive to his mother, but only verbally. Christy felt it was a little more malicious and knew he struggled with mental health issues. She didn't realize how serious it was until that fateful morning. On the morning of the 18th, Christy called 911. what's the address of your emergency? I don't know. I'm on Avoca Street. I need someone right now. What street are you on? Avoca. Avoca? Yeah. 
Okay, what's going on? I was to my best friend for God, she did. I, you think your best friend is dead? All right, just take some deep breaths, okay? What's going on? I don't know, I don't Is she breathing at all? I don't know, I don't want to touch her. She won't answer me, she won't wake up. Okay, can you see her chest rising and falling at all? No, I can't look at her. Okay. The horror and heartbreak in Christy's voice signaled the need of immediate attention. Sobbing, Christy managed to convey the name and age of the victim. It was 46-year-old Jennifer. Police had reached the house by now. Officer Brad Hesselbacher was responding to a routine 911 call during his 5 a.m. to 3 p.m. shift. It was 8.51 a.m. now, not even halfway through. The house on 1605 Avoca Street looked cozy, everything welcoming about it. There was no answer, and the officer knew about the deceased person at the residence. But as soon as the officer went inside, he heard sobbing. It was coming from the other end of the house. The sobbing continued, leading him to a bedroom at the end of the hallway. Upon entering the dark room, they found Christy sitting at the foot of the bed, crying uncontrollably. Hello? Due to her distressed state, she was unable to communicate clearly. The room was dimly lit, and no further details were immediately visible. Christy had run off to the other officer, while Officer Hesselbacher observed the situation. In the darkened bedroom, he found a body on the bed. Jennifer Daisy had been <laughs> Additionally, there was a finger on the nightstand. It just made everything more gruesome. They discovered one other person in the house. Tyler was living in a makeshift setup within his room, which had no proper bed. Instead, he slept on various blankets and comforters scattered across the floor. The room was basic, and he had a large cobalt tool chest that occupied part of the space. Officers searching the room noted that it seemed disorganized, but showed no immediate signs of blood splatter or disturbance. However, in Tyler's backpack, they found tactical gear, including at least two knives. When the officers first encountered Tyler, he was lying on the floor among the blankets, facing the wall. His demeanor during the encounter remains unclear from the description, but the situation was tense, as the officers carefully observed the surroundings. His identification was present in the form of embroidered shirts from his workplace, tri-state quality medals, as well as his wallet and driver's license found within the home. Further investigation led officers to the bathroom. Several towels were tossed haphazardly on the floor, pushed up against the bathtub, giving the impression that someone had recently showered and left the towels behind. The shower curtain, partially drawn, had some odd stains, but nothing concerning. They found a tactical tomahawk resting on a shelf above the toilet. The handle of the tomahawk was hanging off the shelf as if hastily placed there. The officers also discovered a vape device next to the tomahawk. The tomahawk was carefully packaged and sent to a crime lab for further testing, where investigators anticipated checking for DNA blood evidence and fingerprints, all of which would provide more insight into the events that transpired. Tyler was arrested and charged with first-degree homicide and animal abuse. His bail was set at $2 million cash. Kylie Fry had been informed about her mother's passing. As officers prepared to take her down to the station for her statement, they noticed something odd. Kylie was smiling. Kylie was trying to call someone on speaker, but she was very nonchalant with the officers considering the tragedy that had befallen her house. She was even laughing. She's almost flirting with the officer. It's either that or she wants the police to like her. Either way, her behavior is most irregular. Kylie revealed there was some trouble between the two, but it didn't explain her giggling. Was she happy? She's behaving like a schoolgirl. 
considering the fact that Kylie makes TikToks and is a bit of an influencer, she doesn't know how to carry herself, especially in the face of adversity. Her casual, almost gleeful behavior makes her a suspect. She even bats her lashes at him. It's almost comical. But when he returns, Kylie is on the phone. Her tone is much more somber, almost sad. However, as soon as she hangs up and starts talking to the officer, her body language changes. So, um, again, my name's Chad. I'm a, um, Were you there when I called about a guy coming to my house down across Comiskey? Hmm, how long ago? Not that long ago. I don't think <laughs> I so. Wish. I the, wish last, it was the last time I was down at Comiskey was probably a couple, yeah. three weeks ago when there were some juvenile kids that broke out like the bus, uh, that bus little hut thing, where like they were throwing some rocks at the, the glass where the bus comes to pick them up. Oh. And uh, they had broke that, so that was the last time I was down at Comiskey. One would expect her to have some questions about her mother. But instead, she asks the officer if she has met him before. Just turning 18, perhaps, she was still an awkward teenager and was grieving differently. She was probably disconnected from the situation as a defense mechanism. It's important to note here that Kylie had the keys to her mother's house and also had a domestic violence case filed against her. So this should have been a big red flag. I go back to my house, my old house, my mom's house, Monday to about not even 20 minutes later being arrested. She called the cops saying I'm trespassing, I will not leave, and I slapped her foot. I have my rights read to me. I'm in jail for about 14 hours listening to a girl scream the whole night. I have court in the morning and I had to go to work. <laughs> there was a no contact order set in place so I could not go get my car. Luckily, my father and his girlfriend helped me. In the meantime of them getting my car, I was trying to find someone to cover my shift at work because my boss said, figure it out. I am still fighting this case right now. I do have a simple domestic on my record for my mom saying that I slapped her foot. Kylie revealed she was living elsewhere. Immediately, as he mentions her mother's passing, Kylie can't help but smile. Kylie had been living independently and working as a waitress at Village, a place where she had worked for about a year and a half. On the day of her mother, Jennifer Daisy's passing, Kylie was at work when she received a call from her grandparents around 9.59 a.m., informing her that a neighbor had seen an ambulance outside her mother's house. The neighborhood was tight-knit, and several people, including former neighbors, still kept in touch. Initially, Kylie couldn't leave her job as she didn't have a vehicle due to car issues, specifically a split tire. Her neighbor confirmed seeing an ambulance and also mentioned that her brother Tyler was in handcuffs. Unsure of what was happening, Kylie remained at work while continuing to communicate with the people involved. Um, so yeah, basically I was just uh, asked with trying to get some more information from you about um, what's going on today. Again, I'm very sorry for your mother's passing. Yeah. Um, and so from what I gather, just listening to you, it sounds like grandparents, um, called you and told you about it. No, I got a call. Well, first I got a call from my grandparents saying my neighbors are being flipped. We all mm -hmm. have each other's numbers or old neighbors. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. They, the one saw that ambulance was outside. My okay. grandma called to say, hey, there's an ambulance outside. Can you get to, to, the house? to you? Okay. Can you get to the house? I said, at work, I can't do much. I don't have a car. Then I texted Gina, which is the one that said she saw the ambulance. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, what's going on? I don't know. There's ambulance. And I want to say she said Tyler was in cuffs. Eventually, another neighbor offered Kylie a ride to her mother's house. Kylie left work at 10.56 a.m. and arrived at the house just a few minutes later at 10.59 a.m. By the time she got there, she already knew that something serious had occurred based on her phone conversations. She had learned that her mother had passed, and though devastated, Kylie felt somewhat calm. Reflecting on her previous experiences with a person's demise, including the recent loss of her mother's ex-boyfriend seven months before her mother's passing. Christy was also questioned. She had a lot to say. Christy's side of the story centered around the moment she discovered something was wrong with Jennifer. Here's how the events unfolded from her perspective. 
In December, Christy had her own health issues, undergoing a hysterectomy on the 13th, which limited her ability to visit Jennifer frequently. However, they remained in close contact, speaking daily. After Christie's recovery in mid-January 2024, the two made plans to meet on January 18th for coffee. On that morning, Christy ran late after dropping her 8-year-old daughter off at school and headed to Jennifer's house, where she parked in the neighbor's driveway. She entered the house at 8.38 a.m. Christy arrived at Jennifer's house, feeling uneasy because Jennifer wasn't answering her phone and the curtains were drawn and her purse was on the table, which was unusual. You saw her purse. She wasn't answering the phone. The curtains were shut. What'd you do now? Or what were you thinking now? I was just standing there calling her and I was waiting for a response and I got nothing. And when I seen her purse, I stopped and questioned myself. She never leaves without her purse. Like For a split second, she saw Tyler in the doorway to his bedroom, but he quickly disappeared. Sitting on the couch, she noticed Echo was flopped oddly at the other end. She was usually a ball of energy. Christy lifted one paw and it dropped right back. She suddenly had a dreadful feeling and decided to walk toward Jennifer's bedroom. Okay, and where did you end up going next? I was right here by the dining room table. This entrance door right here, Airway, is to her bathroom and then to her bedroom. So I proceeded to walk to her door. Her door was closed. Okay. Christy gently knocked on Jennifer's bedroom door, calling out for her multiple times, expecting her to wake up and opening the door. Still, there was silence. She approached Jennifer's bed, walking past the nightstand. When she finally looked over at Jennifer, she froze in shock. There was a lot of blood. So I gently knocked on it, Opened the door, said, Jenny, come on, you never sleep in like this. Let's go. I'm here. Let's start our day. And no response. And I'm like, like, so I kept, come on, Jenny, let's go. Wake up. Still nothing. Okay, so what did you do then? I then, right here, it was like her bed. And then over here is a a nightstand. I walked up to the corner of the nightstand and her bed. And I stood there and I looked over her. And then I, I froze. The way Jennifer's jaw was positioned reminded Christy of a seizure Jennifer had once experienced, which made her wonder if Jennifer had suffered another seizure and bled out. In a panic, Christy called her boyfriend, Ron, She described the scene, thinking maybe Jennifer had a seizure and bled from her ears. In the dim room, Christy struggled to make sense of what she was seeing. She immediately called 911. While on the phone with the dispatcher, she dropped to the floor, crawling to the door. She herself against a dresser and held the bedroom door closed, overwhelmed by fear. So you called uh, Ron, your boyfriend? Yes. And um, after that, what did you do? After I spoke with him, I hung up the phone and I called 911. And now, so you called the police. What were you thinking at this point? At this point, the amount of blood that I'd seen, I got terrified um, while I was on the phone with 911. And I just dropped to the floor crawled over to the door and she's got dressers when you first walk in her bedroom right here and I just held my feet up against the dressers and held the door close. Even when she was cross-examined during the trial, Christy had a hard time talking about her friend. She struggled to get the words out, recalling the horror of finding her best friend slain Christy stayed barricaded until she heard the police arrive. When he approached, she opened the door, ran to him, and begged not to be left alone. As the officer entered the bedroom, Christy, still panicked, fled. 
as the off, I heard the officer getting closer to me. Um, I did open the door. And as I seen the officer coming around this corner, I hightail booked it out of there and ran into the officer. And I asked him, don't leave me, don't leave me. He proceeded to walk into the bedroom and I proceeded to try to walk out of the home. She hid in the kitchen until Officer Hesselbacher took her outside, where her boyfriend was waiting. Throughout the ordeal, Christy was overwhelmed by the sight of blood and the shock of finding Jennifer in that condition. She was unsure who could have had access to the house. This meant that, aside from Tyler, someone else might have had access to the house. But Christy couldn't continue as she broke down. This was too much for her. The last Jennifer was seen alive was on her ring camera. It was 10 p.m., January 17th, and the motion-activated camera recorded her stepping outside for a bit. According to friends and family, Tyler's mental health had been deteriorating. He was interviewed to see what happened. Tyler explained that the day before the police arrived, he had taken a shower after a workout around 8 p.m. and took another one that morning, explaining why he was naked when they arrived. When asked about owning a hatchet, Tyler confirmed that he did, keeping it in his bedroom toolbox. He even mentioned seeing the hatchet earlier that morning. Did you also ask him when he last showered? I did. I asked him about his bathing habits, and he advised that he used the shower on in the main floor bathroom. Um, he advised that he had taken one shower the evening before, after he had a workout. He ballparked that to be around 8 p.m., and then he advised he had taken another shower just prior to police coming into his home that morning. And that is why he was naked. Did you ask him if he owns a hatchet? I did. Mr. Daly, Daisy acknowledged that he did own a hatchet. Um, he advised me that he kept that hatchet in his toolbox within his bedroom, and he also noted that he had actually observed that hatchet that morning. Throughout the interview, Tyler emphasized his discipline and awareness, noting how he was always mindful of his surroundings. He insisted that his mother was part of a witch coven. Tyler last spoke with his mother just before the police arrived, during which she was allegedly practicing witchcraft in her bed. When pressed about the events that morning, Tyler either said he couldn't remember or changed the subject. Did you ask him about his relationship with his mother? I did. Uh, his response was, it's fine, except for when she's acting sneaky like a witch. He then went on to talk about how his mother was part of a covenant of witches. Um, I, I also asked, I followed that up with how he thought his mom thought of him. And his answer to that question was, I think she hated me so much that she hated herself. Did you ask when he last had a conversation with his mother? Yes, he advised that was just before police came in and got him, and at the time she was practicing witchcraft. Did you ask about specific events that morning? I did multiple times throughout the interview um, early on when I tried to hone in on what he was doing in the minutes, the hours before police arrived. Um, he would either say that he didn't remember or he would shift topic. He described his mother's witchcraft as casting evil on him. An investigator later recounted his interaction with Tyler, where he was angry at his mother. When asked how he felt about her practicing witchcraft, he responded, Did you ask him about his mom's witchcraft? We went into that in a little more detail. Um, he described her witchcraft as putting evil on him. He said, just evil. Um, I then asked him how he felt about his mother practicing witchcraft. Um, and I think that is when he gets into stating something similar to, I just, I just don't, I just gave up. I just don't care. I don't need her to validate me. He then followed that com up, comment up with, um, why would I care what a whore thinks? You sit around and drink yourself stupid like animals and ruin your children's lives. Why would I care what a person like that thinks? It shows just how disconnected and hateful he was towards his mother. 
The detective interviewing him wanted Tyler to say what he had done, to confess, to expedite the process, or at the very least, deny his involvement. The interviewer insisted. How could witchcraft cause physical injuries? Tyler simply ended the interview. The recorder was left on, and the detective realized Tyler was talking out loud when he was alone. Um, I then asked him I was going to need a little better understanding of how witchcraft could cause such injuries. At that time, Mr. Daisy ended the interview. Did you leave the recorder on when you left the interview room? Yes, the, the recorder stayed on until we were all done executing the search warrant on Mr. Daisy's person. Um, after the fact, when I went back and watched the interview um, to type up my report, I noted that Mr. Daisy made um, some comments aloud while we were out of the room. This wasn't the only time Tyler spoke to himself. The officer, while transporting him in the cop car, dropped something and was looking for it. While alone in the car, Tyler spoke again. Did he say anything during that time he was in the squad car? He did. Mr. Daisy made a couple comments uh, during that time. Um, he stated at first, they will never figure out the psychology. You have a choice. Conquer me or hell it is. He then paused, stated, I love you. I'm tired. And that was the end of the comments. As the interviewer took evidence and photographed him, Tyler spoke again about witchcraft. Now, before Mr. Daisy was taken up to the jail floor after the interview, did he say anything spontaneously? Yes, it was actually, he and I were just standing in the interview room together because we had collected the Tyvek suit as evidence. I was waiting for Garrell to return with some clothing. We weren't talking, I wasn't questioning him, and he just stated aloud, witchcraft, brother, witchcraft. He was also found to be incompetent to stand trial. He seemed almost offended that the doctor would declare him mentally unstable. Kylie wanted him to get help instead of spending his life in prison. I don't want him to be put away behind bars because he's not going to get help. I, maybe a mental institution would be the best thing for him. After some treatment, Tyler Daisy's trial began at the 17th of July, 2024. Tyler didn't want to attend his own trial and sent a letter explaining why. To be subject to slavery through usury of law, be it constitution nor amendment, I will not participate. I seek honor to become of worth. I seek God. My mother would be ashamed otherwise, as if of my ancestors. To seek God in death, to become that of life. He further claimed to be of Hebrew descent and had some strange convictions and beliefs about following the Ten Commandments. Even before being sentenced, Kylie tried to get through to him. Tyler, it's so sad how loved you were. And to see how you are now. <laughs> this isn't what I re used to remember. At all. And I know it hurts you. And if it doesn't, that's so sad. I'm sorry that you're that far gone. Seriously. How does it feel to lose your whole family due to one thing that you did? Tyler listened quietly as Kylie spoke, but things changed when she spoke about his faith, or whatever he believed in. You can think you have God, but that's not, that's not a real God at all. <laughs> I don't know what you have going on. Ten Commandments. Okay. <laughs> Look at you. you this Bobby. is sad. You and Christy and Katie, conspiracy to commit murder. Okay. He accused Kylie, Christy, and someone named Katie of conspiracy to commit homicide in the name of witchcraft. Tyler further said she was making a spectacle of the tragedy. I hope you enjoy life in prison. I can live forever. I have God. Ma'am, ma finish what that. you want to say. I enjoy that. At least you have some type of feeling. It would be interesting to note here that Tyler's hatchet tested negative for blood or DNA, which means it is possible that Tyler was being framed due to his mental condition. However, the jury found him guilty, and Tyler Daisy was sentenced to life in prison without parole. While the case may have concluded, many questions remain unanswered. Why wasn't Kylie investigated as a suspect, with her suspicious behavior, motive, means, and the fact that she had no alibi at the time of the homicide. Tyler wasn't the only one with access to the house. 
There was circumstantial evidence at best for Tyler, coupled with the fact that he couldn't distinguish reality from hallucinations. Could he be innocent? Let us know what you think about the case in the comments below. For more videos of unique tragedies and their explanations, please hit like and subscribe.